this is uh, the outline of uh, this is the outline of the presentation. Um, I will first uh, introduce the concept of Industry 4.0 with opportunities and challenges. And then I will present how, as, you, as the Department of Information and Engineering at the University of Pisa, we are uh, preparing to take uh, the challenge of Industry 4.0. Uh, after presenting the approach uh, that we are uh, preparing and we are dealing with at the University of Pisa, I will uh, present some of the research activities I'm involved with. Uh, some of them uh, are uh, in collaboration, as I was mentioning, with uh, MSNT Action. After presenting some of those research activities in the area of the Internet of Things for industrial applications, I will uh, provide a very short overview of some future research opportunities and research activities uh, uh, that uh, will be uh, hopefully a hot topic uh, in the field of cloud computing for the Internet of Things. So what is Industry 4.0? As the name suggests and as the number suggests, Industry 4.0 is the fourth industrial revolution. It came after the first uh, industrial revolution that was uh, fueled by the introduction of mechanical production powered by water and steam followed by the second industrial revolution that was centered around the introduction of uh, uh, electric and powered assembly line that uh, enabled the creation for, of mass production. And the third industrial revolution that uh, uh, was fueled by the introduction of automation, computers, and electronic in the production system. Industry 4.0, will be characterized by the convergence of many enabling technologies, as we will see, among them cyber physical systems, Internet of Things, smart technologies, cloud computing, and so on. Many, as I, as I, as I just mentioned, Industry 4.0 will be characterized by the convergence of many uh, te enabling technologies. Many of them will be coming from uh, information technology coming from computer engineering, computer science, and so on. This slide summarizes some of the main enabling drivers for Industry 4.0. And as you can see, you can recognize many topics in the area of computer engineering, like uh, augmented reality, industrial internet, internet of things, cloud, uh, cybersecurity, big data, and analytics, and so on. Um, so Industry 4.0 is uh, an important uh, occasion, an important opportunity for computer engineers or academia and computer scientists and so on. But before going into the detail of that, uh, what is in practice, what is actually Industry 4.0? Industry 4.0 is not just the development of new technological solution. Enabling technologies are already there, they are already mature, and some of many of those enabling technologies are already are ready to be used and are already used in some industrial contexts. Industry 4.0 is not just uh, training uh, more deep uh, with innovation, uh, training of industrial operators and managers. Industry 4.0 is not only bigger investments in the field of industrial machinery. Industry 4.0 is more a radical change, is more a paradigm shift in which uh, a new and complete and disruptive way of designing, organizing uh, production lines, production uh, industrial processes, uh, a way to uh, a disruptive way to deliver products and services is going to be expected. This uh, radical change requires uh, open mindedness, and in more in particular, a new way of thinking from all the stakeholders involved from entrepreneurs, managers, workers, public institutions, and finally also academic institutions. Industry 4.0 is going to be a very big opportunity uh, for, for academia, as uh, many governments are going to push money on it for research, development, uh, innovation, and so on. So it is a great opportunity for academia and for carrying out their research activities. Uh, so academia, in order to, uh, to benefit from this opportunity and in order to, uh, get, to, to get on board of this train, must change as well uh, in a, a very similar manner, the industrial world is changing. Um, so the academia must face this challenge 
and uh, must uh, handle, must uh, cope with some key requirements for this change. Uh, in particular, academia must focus on two key requirements. First, it must handle very well and it must fuel the cooperation, a tight cooperation with the industrial world. This is something that is always true. A tight cooperation with the industrial world is always beneficial for, uh, for academia and for research activities inside universities. However, with Industry 4.0 going on, this is going to be a crucial point. The second one, the second crucial requirement is interdisciplinarity. As you saw, Industry 4.0 will be characterized by many enabling technologies on different areas. So an interdisciplinary approach to research is going to be crucial in order to keep, uh, to get on board of the Industry 4.0 uh, train in order to get a tight co and interesting collaboration with, uh, with the industry. So how do we, uh, how, how does academia can reinvent themselves, can you reorganize in order to, uh, to uh, get on board of this train in order to be fit for this challenge? Uh, in 2018, we kind of brainstorm on, on, on this issue, on this matter, and we came up with this uh, solution in our Department of Information Engineering at the University of Pisa. And our answer is this project named CropsLab, Innovation for Industry 4.0. This project is funded by the Italian Ministry of Education and Research under a specific call named the Department of Excellence. In 2018, uh, 2017, 2018, the call was out and we decided to participate by um, producing this project named CrossLab that aimed at uh, reinvented and reorganized the department with a more interdisciplinary approach and a more open and integrated approach for industry, specifically for industry 4.0. The project uh, got funded and so it started in 2018 with a five-year department development program. Um, the project was funded by the Italian Ministry of Education and Research with almost 10 million euros uh, as grant. And the target of this program is to reorganize the internal organization of our department in order to foster Industry 4.0 uh, research activities and other research activities that are related with the Industry 4.0, like smart tourism, smart health, smart agriculture, and so on. The Council of Project aims at three main goals, three main pillars uh, that are research, technology transfer, and education. The first one is research, and it aims at reorganizing the department research activities by creating five uh, multidisciplinary uh, laboratories named cross labs. The second pillar is to foster technology transfer by adopting an open approach to collaboration with industries. Uh, the third pillar, last but not least, is of course education. Our goal is to re-engineer, reorganize our courses, our educational offering, in order to introduce all of the courses, Master of Sciences, Bachelors, and so on, a specific path, a specific Industry 4.0 path for students to specialize on those specific Industry 4.0 areas. Uh, at the core of this project uh, is the creation of uh, the Cross Labs. Cross labs are multidisciplinary laboratories uh, in which uh, interdisciplinary research activities can be uh, carried out. Um, the characteristics of those laboratories are interdisciplinary, as I mentioned, integrated. Those laboratories are integrated, meaning that uh, even though we have five labs, uh, they cooperate and they are organized as they were one. And last but not least, uh, they are open. As I, as I mentioned, they are open to collaboration. They are open for industries to come to our lab, work with our equipment, tightly interact with our researchers, students, and so on. So what is the paradigm for the interaction with, uh, with industries? The paradigm is simple. Our laboratories, our cross lab provides the infrastructures, the knowledge, the experience, the students, the researchers, and the technician. And then 
and they are available for uh, industries uh, for their development purposes. So an industry, for instance, can come to us with an idea for development, maybe the lack of the expertise, maybe the lack of the infrastructure to further develop their idea. So they can start with us, uh, they can start work with us for building a prototype to design a prototype. And then after the initial prototyping phase, the prototype can pass over to the industry. So the industry can complete the product engineering with also with still our help and follow up. Uh, the five labs that uh, we created in our, our department are the following. We have a cross lab in augmented reality, a cross lab in additive manufacturing, a cross lab in advanced manufacturing, a cross lab in industry, industrial internet of things, and another, another one in cloud big data and cybersecurity. Professor Giuseppe Anastasi is the director of this program. And uh, myself, I am the coordinator of this cloud, big data, and cybersecurity uh, cross-lab laboratory. Those laboratories have just been uh, opened uh, and are available. Uh, they have new equipment founded uh, with a grant from the ministry, and they are available in a location named uh, Polo Technological, which is, uh, let's say, let's call it uh, an incubator for startups and small uh, industries, um, and small industries. Uh, this is a perfect environment for the cross lab since those laboratories are in fully integrated into an incubator, and so they can easily interact with, uh, uh, with other businesses and other uh, industries. Those laboratories covered uh, many, and I would say all uh, the topics of uh, and, and enabling technologies uh, of Industry 4.0. And as you can recognize, uh, many of them are related with the computer engineering, computer science, uh, information technologies, and so on, uh, like Internet of Things, cloud computing, big data, and analytics. So this is how we are dealing with Industry 4.0 in our department, uh, just to introduce uh, uh, our approach. Uh, some of these uh, research activities uh, that, are, uh, that are being carried out inside those cross labs are uh, related with uh, some topics I'm involved with as a researcher at the department. Uh, and so for the reminder of this presentation, I would like to, uh, to introduce you some of my research activities, and in particular, some research activities in the field of uh, Internet of Things for industrial application. As uh, Sajal was mentioning, uh, some of those activities are carried out uh, in collaboration uh, between uh, the University of Pisa and MSNT, and uh, in particular carried out uh, uh, with uh, the involvement of myself, uh, Professor Giuseppe Anastasi, and uh, uh, Francesca Righetti, um, and uh, of course, uh, Professor Das. Um, so before going on into the details of, uh, uh, of those research activities, let me go back a little bit uh, on, uh, and, and talk about uh, industrial, uh, industrial IoT systems. Industrial IoT systems are quite different from uh, the IoT system that you could find, the regular IoT system that you, you could, for instance, buy for your home, regular IoT system that you could find on the market in general. This is because industrial applications are usually characterized by quality of service requirements, strict quality of service requirements, okay? Um, so they are characterized by timing requirements, reliability requirements that are usually less, uh, less stringent for regular uh, systems available in the market. Um, IoT applications and IoT systems in general for, for, from the industrial context can, could be categorized into three group uh, into three categories, safety critical applications, control applications, and monitoring applications, depending on their requirements. The first group uh, is uh, the safety critical application. Uh, that uh, includes usually emergency uh, control systems. Those uh, systems are the most critical that you could find in an industrial environment. Usually they require a uh, very reliable uh, system, and in particular, a very reliable communication and data transfer from the cyber physical system to the services and applications. Because if the communication disrupts, even for some milliseconds, some, uh, serious, uh, uh, some serious dangers could occur in the industrial system, and even the life of uh, the workers might be put in danger. So for those uh, applications, uh, the system must be extremely reliable 
And in particular, they usually require a very low latency for data collection and data analysis. The second group is control application. They might range uh, uh, very significantly for significantly from uh, closed loop regulatory control from to open loop controls. Those are control applications that usually control the industrial environment uh, with a certain degree of, uh, uh, of requirements in terms of uh, reliability and in terms of latency. They usually could, uh, could, uh, um, could tolerate uh, a certain level of loss in the information, a little bit. They could tolerate a, a certain level of latency, but however, for the system to properly work, they must, uh, um, they must have a communication system or in general, a system that is uh, extremely reliable and with a predictable and bounded latency. Last but not least is the fourth category, that is monitoring application. For those applications, usually they, those applications usually don't have uh, latency requirements. They do have uh, um, reliability requirements uh, because they are usually designed to monitor a certain industrial environment and report an alert if something goes wrong for logging and implement uh, predictive maintenance. So they usually want to get all the data. They don't want to lose uh, some data. And also for the latency, they could tolerate higher latency uh, but uh, they, in any case, would like to have a bounded and predictable latency. So those requirements usually affect significantly the choice for the communication system. Usually for industrial environments, you have two options for the communication system. You have uh, a wired technology option or a wireless technology option. Wired networks are usually used for critical function, so class 0, 1, and 2, the first uh, classes of application I presented before. And this is because uh, wired networks usually provide uh, uh, high reliability, fault tolerance, uh, bounded and deterministic latency, and so on. Example of those technologies are the technology provided by the IEEE 802.1 TSN working group, time sensitive networking and the work provided by the Deterministic Networking Working Group, or DEFNET, at EETF. Wireless network counterparts, instead, usually in an industrial environment, are used on all the applications that can tolerate some loss and some latency. So they are usually used for non-critical functions that are class 5, 4, 3, and 2. Wireless networks, even though they are usually unreliable nowadays, there are standards that can provide reliable communication, bounded latency, scalability, energy efficiency, and security. Those could also ensure, uh, wireless standard can also provide some benefits in terms of uh, flexibility, mobility, easy of deployment, limited cost, and so on. So the wireless network, uh, every time they can be used, they provide uh, some big advantage because they can reduce the time to the creation of a system, the time for our deployment, uh, they can handle mobility, they can provide some degree of flexibility and so on. An example of a wireless standard currently ongoing, I would say the most promising one is the six tish architecture currently under definition uh, within the six tish working group at ETF. 6TISH stands for IPv6 over the TISH mode of IEEE 802.15.4. And the goal of this standard is to enable IPv6 based communication over low power and lossy network for soft real time industrial applications, non critical industrial applications. The architecture of this standard is quite simple. Uh, you have a set of industrial IoT devices, uh, everyone connected through a wireless technology. In this case, the wireless technology is the IEEE 802.15.4 TSCH technology. I will go into some details of this technology in the next slides. Those devices communicate each other and they are connected to external networks, uh, so an external network, or so even uh, the internet, through one or more backbone routers or also border routers, named border routers. Through those border routers, uh, these uh, low power and lossy industrial network can connect uh, with an external IPv6 network 
or can even connect to the internet. So an application running in the cloud could interact with one of those industrial devices in order to fetch data or in order to trigger some changes by, for instance, sending a command. Uh, the 60 standard, the 60 architecture integrate those devices into IPv6 networks by defining two different uh, sub-layers that integrate the IEEE HHU point in four fish network into IPv6 networks. These two layers are the six top layer and the six open layer. Uh, in order to ensure uh, wide coverage, multi-hop data transmission is also employed in this kind of standard by adopting the RPL routing protocol that can enable multi-hop data communication inside the um, inside the um, inside the the network. The core of this solution is the IEEE 802.15 for uh, uh, MAC layer, which is a wireless technology defined some years back by IEEE. The core of this technology is TSCH, time slotted channel access. As the name suggests, this wireless technology employs two methods, the time slotted access and the multi-channel and the channel hopping method in order to ensure time slotted access, so timed um, data transmission and uh, the multi-channel communication and channel hopping for reliable transmission and interference resilience transmission. Uh, the time slotted access is implemented as follows. Time is divided by node in fixed time slots named cells in the jergo of the standard. Each one of those cells is assigned to one specific IoT node for data transmission. Those are named dedicated cells. So those cells are assigned to one specific device for data transmission. And through these specific assignments, uh, collision-free data transmission can be achieved, okay? In addition to dedicated cells, another type of cells, shared cells, can be assigned to nodes in order to allow transmission of multicast or broadcast data, okay? So this allocation of slots ensure collision-free data transmission does ensuring timed and reliable data transmission, okay? The other technology adopted by the standard is channel hopping. This technology is adopted to mitigate the effects of interference of a, on a single frequency, okay? The rationale behind this technology is to have the devices transmitting in the network to move from one frequency to another over time. In order to do that, the standard define a fixed channel hopping uh, sequence that is shared across all the devices in the network, and it is adopted by all the devices in the network. By adopting this channel hopping sequence over time, devices can hop from one sequence to another and perform their transmission on different frequencies over time. Thanks to this approach, if one frequency is jammed, for instance, because there is an interfering system on the same frequency, only a small amount of transmissions are affected are impaired, and thanks to retransmission on different frequencies, this uh, problem can be solved. So the result is, uh, a, let's say, a matrix of transmission opportunities, uh, and uh, the way transmissions occur and are performed by nodes is defined by IEEE 802.15.4 TSCH standard. However, the standard does not address how cells transmission opportunities should be allocated to nodes, okay? In order to do that and allow the integration with IPv6 networks, the 6-dish architecture defined an additional layer on top of this IEEE 802.15.4 TSSH, which is named 6-top. 6-top uh, bridges the gap between IPv6 and the MAC layer, and in particular also implements 
algorithms and protocol to negotiate and allocate the transmission opportunity on the TSCH. The standard itself, uh, the 60 standard, defines uh, four approach, four different policies for the allocation of transmission opportunities. And those are summarized in this slide. Uh, we have, for instance, a centralized scheduling that, I, that is a centralized approach in which a central entity allocates a transmission opportunity to all the nodes in the network based on network conditions and application uh, requirements. We have uh, distributed scheduling in which uh, uh, transmission opportunities are dynamically negotiated between neighbors. Autonomous scheduling in which devices uh, schedules their transmission opportunities in an autonomous manner. We'll see how in a few slides. And last but not least, we have Hope by Hope, uh, which is a cell reservation uh, uh, that is based uh, Hope by Hope through an end to end signaling uh, from a sender to a receiver. In our research activities, we focused on two groups, distributed and autonomous scheduling, because they were the most promising and they, they were the most, uh, um, and, and they were the ones that attracted the highest attention from uh, the research community. Uh, because they are the ones that promise uh, a network which is autonomous, that can accommodate changes uh, and they can accommodate fluctuations over time and provide the flexibility that uh, industrial application usually require. Um, before going on, before going into the details of our research, uh, let me just uh, quickly introduce some of the details uh, about this two scheduling approach. The first one is the distributed scheduling. The distributed scheduling doesn't have a central entity for managing the resources. Uh, on the contrary, nodes uh, uh, dynamically negotiate uh, uh, the transmission opportunities to sell each other, uh, neighbor to neighbor. This uh, negotiation of uh, transmission opportunities is performed uh, by a protocol defined by the standard, which is named 6P protocol. The 6P protocol defines all the functions and messages for the nodes, uh, for the devices uh, to negotiate each other the transmission opportunities and allocate some uh, cells uh, to transmit uh, the data to a neighbor and eventually to destination. Uh, the 6P protocol, however, does not define any policy for the allocation of resources. This is performed by an algorithm that is, usually, that is named as scheduling function. So the scheduling function is a policy used by every device to request for the allocation of new cells. The scheduling function in particular is executed periodically by a node and calculates the number of cells to be added or to be removed by a node in the communication with a neighbors with a neighbor based on traffic conditions and network conditions. In our work, we started by analyzing this 6P protocol with the goal of assessing if this protocol was suitable for industrial environments, and in particular, if it could guarantee stability and if it guarantee the allocation of transmission resources in time and in a reliable manner. So we started by analyzing this protocol and our evaluation highlighted some critical drawbacks in this protocol. In particular, uh, it highlighted the fact that the protocol required uh, some configuration in its parameter in order to work uh, properly. And in particular, uh, the configuration of the parameters uh, depended uh, on uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the size of the network. The 6P messages are transmitted on shared cells. So on cells that are shared across different uh, devices. And since they are shared, those devices might result, uh, those transmissions might result in collision. In mean, so in, in order for the 6P messages to be transmitted properly, a certain amount of, of shared cells must be allocated in the network, depending on the size of the network, in order to ensure that the 6P protocol can operate properly. Our analysis of the 6P protocol went on, and in particular, we focused then on, uh, this, on security aspects of this protocol. Uh, and in particular, we highlighted some security weaknesses of the protocol that could allow an attacker to, uh, in, to mount a denial of service attack or simply an attack that could degrade the performance of the protocol and the network in general. 
After analyzing the CXP protocol, we moved to analyzing the distributed scheduling function that were available in literature. We focused initially on two scheduling functions, that is the minimal scheduling function and the on-the-flight scheduling function. We focused on these two scheduling functions initially because uh, those were the scheduling functions that were uh, defined by the 60 working group as reference scheduling functions. So the working group were, defined is, were defining this scheduling function as a reference in, for future implementation. Initially, we evaluated uh, in particular OTF. Uh, our evaluation, our initial evaluation highlighted some uh, criticalities with OTF. So also we came up with a third scheduling function named enhanced OTF uh, proposed by us that uh, fixed uh, some weak points of uh, OTF. Just to give you an idea of how those scheduling functions uh, uh, work, uh, I will very quickly uh, illustrate uh, how MSF work. Um, MSF is executed uh, autonomously by each node and it is executed periodically. Periodically, the node evaluates uh, the uh, usage of uh, the cells that are currently allocated to a node. So shortly, it evaluates how much those cells are used in the past period and how much they are unused. If the usage of uh, those cells are below a certain uh, minimum threshold, the scheduling function commands the, um, the release of some cells because, the, because some cells are unused. If the usage of, uh, so of those cells in the last period instead is above a certain maximum threshold instead, we are in the opposite situation, meaning that uh, those cells are all used and maybe they are overutilized. In order to allow the node to transmit more data and uh, transmit the backlog of data the node has, the algorithm commands the 6P protocol to acquire new cells. A different approach instead is adopted by autonomous scheduling functions. With autonomous scheduling function, we have uh, uh, no negotiation, no neighbor to neighbor cell negotiation. So the 6P protocol is no longer used. Cells are allocated autonomously by, by nodes, for instance, using a shared uh, algorithm, for instance, based on a hash function. The advantages of this approach is that uh, no, no overhead due to negotiation is needed, and no further delay is introduced by six top transactions. This approach, however, has a big drawback, which is the fact that these scheduling functions cannot handle varying traffic conditions, since usually the amount of cells scheduled by each node is fixed. Uh, the cells, uh, so uh, in literature, we have uh, two examples of autonomous uh, scheduling functions that are Orchestra and Ellis. Uh, both of them adopt, uh, adopt uh, two different uh, approaches, a node-based approach and a link-based approach. Very quickly, the node-based approach, uh, in the node-based approach, uh, uh, cells are scheduled by every node um, based on, uh, the, on some kind of property of the node. So every node allocates a cell for the reception of data from uh, neighbors. Every neighbor that wants to send uh, some data to another neighbor can uh, retrieve autonomously the cell on which the node is listening to and can send that data to, a part, to that particular cell. The cell might, might be, for instance, computed based on the hash of the MAC address, for instance. The main drawback of this approach is that, every, is that one node has one single cell for receiving data from all the, its neighbors. So um, if a node will receive data from multiple neighbors, collisions might arise. This issue is fixed by the link-based approach. In the link-based approach, cells are allocated into an autonomous manner uh, per link. So if two nodes want to communicate, they use the hash function to compute the cell on which they should communicate. And the cell is different for every pair of nodes in the network. In this case, 
you don't have collisions. However, the number of cells that you will have to allocate in this case is higher. And so it is, it is more likely to have a collision in the allocation, for instance, of the hash function. Um, in our uh, uh, evaluation, in our analysis, we considered Alice, which was uh, the latest uh, autonomous uh, scheduling function. And we considered it with a specific feature in order to make uh, the comparison uh, fair. We considered uh, this feature in particular, the frame pending feature, uh, in, uh, defined inside the IEEE 802.1540 SCH standard that allows some node that requires that they still have some additional data to be transmitted after a cell to trigger the further transmission by a node at least for a limited amount of time. This gives uh, Alice at least a bit of dynamicity to cope with uh, varying traffic conditions. So what we did in our, in our analysis is, was to assess and evaluate those scheduling functions in order to uh, provide an analysis and a set of guidelines uh, in order to answer the question, which one of the scheduling functions I mentioned before was the proper one for an industrial environment, depending on applications and network conditions. With this aim, we carried out a performance evaluation considering three scheduling functions I mentioned before, EOTF, MSF, and ARIS. We considered a mixed approach with both simulations and experiments. For the simulations, we considered, for instance, a grid of varying size, and we considered different uh, uh, traffic patterns, for instance, a uh, uh, many to one traffic, for instance, to mimic uh, a monitoring application with uh, upward traffic from sensors to a collector, a root node, a uh, one to many traffic uh, to mimic a downward traffic, for instance, for a control application that sends commands to all the IoT devices in the network, and uh, a many to many traffic uh, with a mix of uh, upward and downward traffic to mimic a uh, machine-to-machine communication application. We considered also two different types of uh, traffic patterns, uh, periodic traffic and varsity traffic. And those, those are very, very quickly the summary of, our, of, of the results we obtained. Um, in this slide, uh, I'm reporting the packet delivery ratio, defined as the ratio between the amount of uh, uh, packets successfully received at destination over the number of packets sent by all the nodes in the network with a varying uh, network size and different configuration of the SCH. Um, as you can see, uh, when the network size is, uh, is small, uh, below uh, 25, uh, all uh, the three scheduling functions can ensure a very good performance in terms of packet delivery ratio. The packet delivery ratio is almost close to one. So 100% of the packets are delivered successfully. However, as the network size increases above 25, uh, the packet delivery ratio keeps uh, constant with MSF and EOTF. So it is at the top 100%. But with Alice, uh, the packet delivery ratio decreases significantly. This is because uh, Alice uh, cannot tolerate uh, an increasing amount of traffic while the other two um, scheduling function are uh, prone, uh, are capable of handling uh, a varying traffic condition. The same results were highlighted also with the results with varsity, with varsity traffic. So in conclusions, what are the conclusions that we could uh, uh, draw? When upward traffic is considered, as soon as a moderate offered, uh, offered load in the network, so a small network size is considered, Alice is the optimal choice because as an autonomous scheduling function, it can provide its functionalities with a minimum overhead and a lower duty cycle. However, when the uh, traffic increases significantly, EOTF and MSF are mandatory, are the only choice because they are the only uh, policies that could handle a varying traffic condition. When instead the varsity traffic with a very dynamic pattern is instead uh, adopted, uh, EOTF outperforms the other because EOTF, it has a specific mechanism to handle high bars of traffic. When instead downward and mixed 
upward and downward traffic is considered instead, Alice is surprisingly the best option. This is because Alice has a mechanism to handle both upward and downward traffic, while uh, um, MSF and EOTF does not. Okay. So this was, this was just a very quick overview of uh, the industrial Internet of Things works uh, we are carrying out. Uh, before, uh, to, to conclude, I would like to just quickly open a very short window on a different but related uh, research topic, which, which is uh, cloud computing, in order to highlight some uh, research, future research opportunities that are getting uh, hot uh, at the moment, uh, and, uh, uh, and highlighting a direction that we would like to explore uh, in the future. Uh, cloud computing is an enabling technology uh, for every system in the world and even industrial, and in particular for industrial Internet of Things uh, uh, systems. Cloud computing is an enabling technology because it's, it's cheap, it allows for rapid deployment of systems, uh, and it is scalable, and it is already exploited for many industrial applications. Sensors uh, send data through the Internet to a a cloud computing application that analyzes uh, the data and send back, for instance, a feedback. It's, pretty, it's a pretty common strategy. So that approach, however, has a drawback. And th this drawback resides on the architecture of the system itself. Cloud computing adopts uh, a centralized approach, uh, which has some limitations. And in particular, it uh, makes almost impossible to implement on this architecture critical applications. As we saw, critical application requires a low and bounded latency, which is impossible when the data has to be transmitted over the internet. Uh, also, the fact that data has to be transmitted continuously over an internet connection make the system weak. If we have a network outage and the internet connection goes down, the system cannot properly work because data cannot be offloaded to the cloud system. So what we would like to have in an industrial system for support critical application is to bring some of the application logic back from the cloud to the industrial side. In order to fulfill this objective, recently a new approach was, uh, uh, was provided and was uh, uh, introduced. And this approach is fog computing. Focal so, Carlo, computing. sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, do you think that you can finish in another two, three minutes? Then uh, five, five, time minutes for questions? five minutes and, uh, and, and I'm done. Okay, good. Two, three minutes. I'll, I'll, keep, I'll try to keep two, three minutes. Sure. Thank then you. we can Thank have questions. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, for computing is a new additional layer that has been introduced uh, in between cloud computing and IoT devices in order to support the execution of uh, a part of data analysis uh, application logic in proximity of the industrial systems. This uh, fog computing uh, layer allows for a part of the applications to work in proximity of the IoT devices and benefits uh, for, a con for a direct communication with them with low latency and high reliability because the internet is only evolved. This fog layer is implemented using uh, uh, powerful uh, PC, small servers, and powerful embedded computing. They usually adopt uh, a uh, virtualization uh, uh, technology in order to uh, uh, keep the benefit of cloud computing. So the result is, uh, is, industrial, are, is a picture in which industrial application could be split out. The logic of the industrial application could be, could be split out in part in the cloud and in part in the fog. Those applications could still interact with the IoT devices using, for instance, IPv6 connectivity. So the result is a cloud to thing continuum and uh, a multi-layer and multi-level computing infrastructure where applications could be instantiated and migrated dynamically from the cloud to the fog and vice versa in order to accommodate different uh, quality of service requirement by applications. For instance, uh, big data applications could be instantiated in the cloud. Uh, instead, critical applications with timing and reliability requirements could be instantiated in the fog. What is the next challenge uh, uh, in, in, this, in this picture? The next challenge is uh, how to manage this cloud thing continuum in an integrated manner. Solutions to, in, to manage and handle computing resources are already there. There is plenty of literature. 
network resources, solutions to manage network resources are already there. There are plenty. I, I offered some examples in my presentations. The next challenge in this picture is to provide solutions to integrate them and to, uh, to, to, to create new solutions and novel approaches uh, to you know, fulfill this challenge and manage those resources in a seamless and integrated manner. Those are some readings. Uh, I, will, uh, uh, I will leave the slides to Dr. Das uh, if you want to, to have in particular those, uh, those, those references. Those are the, uh, the contacts for Professor Anastasia and those are mine. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope I'm not uh, over time uh, uh, a lot. Thank you, so thank John. you very much, Carlo, for a very informative talk. And of course, the thank history of University of Pisa and Pisa as a city. Is, is, is beautiful. And Thank you. for the audience, you have seen that, uh, that how old and reputed University of Pisa is. Uh, even Galileo was a faculty there. Yeah. Uh, the point is that uh, Missouri SNT and University of Pisa has a MOU. So anybody who wants to visit University of Pisa for taking courses over there or research, uh, we have that opportunity. Our international office can facilitate that. Okay. So we have a strong collaboration Absolutely. and relationship with University of Pisa. And yes. Professor Joseph Anastasi is the contact on that side. Anyway, so it's time for question and answers now. Uh, you can ask the questions directly or you can put on the chat, um, whatever you prefer. It's time now. Uh, so let me give a jump start. I think sometimes people yeah. are shy probably that uh, uh, you mentioned at the very beginning the industry 4.0 and of course different types of things, advanced manufacturing and other kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Now, in your research, or let's say Professor Joseph Anastasi's research, are you dealing with any particular industry applications? And what are the objectives there? Anything that you can, uh, because industry 4.0 is about cyber physical systems, smart systems, and all this kind of stuff. But in addition to the research, any practical uh, industry applications that you are dealing with and you're applying the technology. Yes, of... yes. The, 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 the very good thing about uh, this cross lab initiative is that uh, uh, we can offer to industries an integrated approach. And uh, <clears throat> since we started this, this program, uh, we had uh, many contacts with industries and it was a real boost for, for collaboration. And uh, one of the goal of this project is to, you know, create a network of industries uh, in Tuscan. Okay, so because part of the, the, the funding came from uh, the Tuscany region, we are committed to, to collaborate with industries. And uh, in particular, we have uh, many contacts from the manufacturing area. So there is a part of, uh, of Tuscany that is, uh, has a very strong uh, manufacturing presence, uh, especially in the textile area, shoes, uh, uh, clothes, uh, and so on. And uh, so we, we, have, we have many contacts and we are collaborating with industries like in, in that area. For instance, some of them, they contacted us to try to you know, integrate uh, cyber physical systems into their, their production systems. Uh, for instance, for safety, uh, we, had some, we have some research uh, and activities going on, for instance, for, for in, in the area of safety to analyze video surveillance images uh, uh, to um, analyze when uh, some person, some operator enters in a dangerous area without, you know, protective, uh, uh, protective gears, protective uh, uh, helmet, uh, and so on, or uh, to stop uh, uh, machinery when someone uh, goes in proximity of them, for instance, uh, during <clears throat> a certain operation, and so on. So those are the collaboration we are, we are having at the moment. Uh, and this is the, 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 the field, the application that we are considering. And th th those are very practical because they have practical needs, uh, you know, to integrate their, their production systems uh, with new technologies uh, and so on. And that's what, what, that's what we are doing. And the good thing is that we are providing them, um, you know, an integrated approach. So we have the computer scientists, uh, the computer engineer, the robotic engineer, so if uh, we need something related with, with controls, we have that knowledge and so on. Good, good. There's a question from Johnny, which is kind of related, but I asked yeah. him to ask this question. Johnny, you can ask. And for the opportunities on the intelligent infrastructure at MST, we can talk about it. And you and I can have a chat, but you can ask the question to Dr. Valati. Hello, Johnny. Johnny, are you there? 
Yes. Yes. Uh, thanks, yeah. uh, Dr. Valeta. Uh, fantastic presentation. So actually, you, yeah, I basically Dr. Das asked the question, so I'm follow up. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit about your focus applications of the industry 4.0 at uh, cross lab and uh, more importantly, uh, the intelligent infrastructure opportunity. So with MST, I think we have a center here as well. So, okay. thanks. Um, yeah, uh, th th thank you very much. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the uh, as I was mentioning, we, we are open uh, to, to, <coughs> to, to a wide range of uh, different target applications. Um, I was mentioning the manufacturer one, but uh, uh, we have other uh, things going on about uh, uh, intelligent uh, intelligent systems and so on. Um, we have uh, uh, we have an infrastructure going on. We have an infrastructure built uh, inside those uh, those cross labs. Okay, uh, I have a couple of pictures over here, so I can use them. Um, we, we have an infrastructure uh, that we are creating uh, thanks to, to the grant. And uh, this is a complete uh, industry 4.0 infrastructure that we are creating that includes uh, uh, SDN, software defined networking, 5G, fog edge computing, cloud computing, and internet of things. And they are all integrated together to create uh, an industry 4.0 uh, testbed that is available for experimentation, creation of uh, intelligent industrial systems uh, and, and so on. So um, we are, we are totally open to for collaboration. So if there is room, uh, you have my, my contact and we can chat about that uh, totally. Okay. Very good. In fact, at, at SNT, we have a lot of uh, strength in uh, intelligent systems center. We have a center, advanced manufacturing, uh, transportation. Okay. Uh, we have yeah, a lot, a lot of uh, interest. So very interesting. Uh, okay. If we can collaborate, we are of course open to sure. that. Absolutely. So Manoj, you are next. Uh, thank you, Professor Das. Uh, Professor Valati, that was a very uh, interesting talk. Thank you for that. And thank you. my question is, uh, IIoT like uh, has been uh, popular. And I just wanted to know what is your opinion on integrating IIoT with federated learning uh, I'm assuming like it, uh, it's going to solve a lot of issues with terms of security, privacy, and communication overheads. So yeah. I wanted to know your opinion on that. Uh, that is a very good question. Uh, the the federated learning as uh, as tool uh, is is something that is going to be valuable for sure in this world. So I completely agree with you that 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 federated learning is going to fit uh, to fit into into this landscape. And uh, that is going to be, federated learning is going to be an enabling technology, not only for, for creating novel industrial application and still preserving privacy, but I guess uh, as soon as the size of those industrial environments uh, reach, reaches a, a certain point, uh, so they get larger and larger, those industrial environments in the future, federated learning might be an enabling technology for managing the infrastructure itself. Because as you know, an autonomous learning approach, uh, that could be crucial for managing the infrastructure itself. I don't know if uh, that answers your question, but uh, I totally agree with you. It is going to be a great, uh, uh, a great tool for applications, but not only for application. Thank you. Good. Yeah, Dr. Nandanla, you are next. <laughs> So, hi, Carlo. Uh, you can call me Sid. And, um, I see. So, uh, I have an interesting question for you. So, you've been talking mostly about Industry 4.0, mm -hmm. um, which is mostly about evolution of industry and so on and so forth. But typically, when you look at how, uh, how industrial revolution has progressed, they typically mm -hmm. associate it with this, to the societal progress as well. So society has been uh, also I mean, people people specifically demarcate progress in society in terms of society 1.0, 2.0, so on. And industry 4.0 is typically mapped with society 5.0. Yeah. And the reason why I'm bringing that bringing this is because um, 
usually some sort of an industrial revolution is mapped to its impact on people mm-hmm. and i'm trying to understand how your work may have an impact on the society beyond industry um, yeah i i do understand that you have a direct yeah 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 i, I get your point yeah but scheduling uh, an idea can be used beyond industry so uh, yeah so um there are, there is a very good question um the uh, i want to highlight two things the first one is uh, that uh, uh, usually the, the 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 technologies that we could that we are studying uh, we we really, we really focus on industry 4.0 because recently you know we got this opportunity from the government uh, and uh, the lab was reorganized in order to fit this industry 4.0 that it co- called that is challenging but all those technologies could uh, be applied very effectively also on other domains like smart cities uh, as you were mentioning and uh, many of us many researchers in my department are very active uh, in this area uh, they are part of uh, national laboratories on smart cities in particular also professor anastasia and i we are very active in this uh, in, the, in, in the area of smart cities uh, with other research topic than than uh, industrial internet of things and so on so uh, those those technologies uh, could be applied to smart cities smart tourism and, and so on so can i can i ask you a more specific question let, let me just let, let me just finish so the, the second part of my answer is this the the impact the societal impact of those technologies is very important and uh, like uh, the other industrial revolution had an impact on society okay and how for example jobs and workers could perceived uh, the industry 4.0 will have and uh, we are aware of that and that's why i didn't mention uh, in my presentation but in our organization of the cross lab project we created actually a sixth lab named it and society where our researchers and scientists uh, collaborate with uh, people from um, societal sciences in order to understand and evaluate how this new novel technologies uh, and industry 4.0 technologies will impact uh, society in general <clears throat> go, go ahead so, sorry i interrupted so to follow up uh, on the question that i asked yeah i meant in terms of impact is so we know that we come up with all these fancy you know uh, solutions digital solutions but when you deploy them that can cause discrimination in the society uh, probably because of some of the uh, because of the way we design them uh because we ignore some of the, the yeah we ignore the risks from a societal point of view right uh, have you seen any of that uh in your work i mean when you when you take these ideas and deploy it mm, not directly not directly but sometimes i had the sense that um, maybe so, some technology could be could be a harm from a societal point of view uh sometimes automation it's uh, it's it, it could be a danger for you know for jobs so if if you introduce too many automation uh, iot and things like that to to control to solve problems uh, in an autonomous or autonomous manner there is always the risk that uh, you might have an impact also on the organization some jobs could be lost uh, uh and and so on however you you know the, the, the this is not in my opinion this is not something that we should uh, i mean we should take into account that but from the point of view that this e- education is paramount so uh, if, if in the industrial uh, areas or industries in general should you know promote uh, innovation on one side but also education on the other so people that might work in areas that uh, are uh, going to be innovated uh, automated and so on uh, uh, we need uh, you know to 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 reinvent themselves and uh, industry should you know invest uh, in, uh, in in education for them that's why for instance we are uh, collaborating with industries tightly for for you know specialized courses uh, to uh, you know uh, to to reeducate uh, um, workers uh, to new and novel areas uh, uh for, for for them to you know reposition themselves inside the company right thank you thank you okay. thank you very much yeah. gopinath you are next
Yeah, thank you, Professor. Yeah, from Dr. Vallati, like I'm having a question. Like, uh, just yeah. just I want to understand more on how TSCH applications work or what are the generic applications based on the TSCH initially. Um, so examples are all um, non-critical applications that I was I was mentioning. So something. So if you have an application that has uh, critical uh, requirements, uh, you should connect them uh, through wire to wire technologies. Okay. If you have applications that have some requirements but are not as stringent as the other ones, uh, you should go for Tish. Tish. Uh, for instance, uh, monitoring, monitoring application, they are good for TISH. TISH can ensure time delivery and in particular reliable delivery, meaning that, uh, uh, that uh, um, data is always uh, received and trans transmitted and received at destination. So you don't get lost uh, any of the samples. Um, another example, it could be, you know, remote monitoring for alarms uh, or, uh, you know, soft control for the system. So if you have uh, an, uh, an application that monitor a system and change some of the configuration of the system, but not in real time, like over a medium term, Tish is good for that because you have the reliability in the communication, but you have also the possibility to, uh, to, 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 to provide the applications with a timed data transmission. Okay, I, I'm not, I don't know if that answered your question. Um, yeah, more or less it answered to some extent. So to be more specific, like if I consider an example in battlefield or in underground mines where the communication is more needed because we do not have cellular networks at that, at that place. So how is there any chance to employ these TISH, net, tish uh, applications or any, any suggestions on that? I'm sorry, I'll, 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 I partially lost your voice. Oh, sorry. So, like, to be more specific, uh, in battlefields or in underground mines, we do not have cellular networks. So, at that time, communication is needed to talk with other people who are on the other side. Okay. So, can we use these uh, TSH applications? I, I, I think so. We, we should take a look at the, um, at the requirements, at the specific requirements in terms of reliability, latency, and so on. But I think it, it, could, be, it could be a good, a, a good example for that. If you, if you want... You can drop me an email and we can uh, we can exchange some ideas and uh, we can evaluate it together.